Should you buy a radio from Japan? Let's talk about HFNet, who own the frequency. And what should your first HF portable antenna be this time on Mailbag Monday? What is happening, everyone? Thanks for tuning in to Ham Radio Tube. My name is Mike K at MRD. If you have a question for me, shoot me an email. K at MRD at iCloud.com. We've got three great things to talk about today, so let's dive right in. Our first question this viewer is asking, I have a burning desire to purchase a new radio. Uh, leave a comment down below if you too have a burning desire to purchase a new radio. I feel that's probably all of us. I have no need for one. Yep, come on. And I'm sure my wife would agree with that. <laughs> what are you talking about? You've had it this whole time. <laughs> but there are so many radios that need a good home, and I feel I can provide one. So, the radio I have my eye on is on eBay and would be coming from Japan. The radio is the Yesu VX3. That's a cool radio, which I'm sure you know is not made any longer. My question is, is there a major difference in a radio from Japan or one purchased in the U.S.? Well, my friend, let me Google that for you. So the radio in question is uh, this here, this Yesu VX3 dual band 144 and 430 megahertz handy transceiver pocket size brand new Japan. Uh, the frequency alone should already be a red flag, but it's important to know that uh, us in the United States versus uh, other countries around the world, we do have different band plans. And uh, my good friend Jason over at Ham Radio 2.0 actually bought a Yesu 818 from Japan when, uh, one, once they were announced that they were going to discontinue them and he found out. Uh, I don't know if he knew ahead of time. He probably did. I, I would give him the benefit of the doubt, but... Uh, it didn't have the same frequencies that we do in the US. And if we go over to the internet machine and do a simple Google search for the Japanese amateur radio band plan, uh, we can see the 144 megahertz band they have from 144 megahertz to 146 megahertz, where us in the States have 144 to 148. And looking at the 70 centimeter band, you can see they start at 430 megahertz and stop at 440, where us in the States have 420 all the way up to 450 megahertz. So much like Jason on his Yesu 818, uh, his transceiver was locked to those frequencies that is the Japanese amateur band plan. It's, it's not like a Bofang. You can't unlock them and, and open them up. Like, they're <laughs> they're done. What You get what you get. So on Jason's 818, uh, like on 40 meters, they can only go to 7200, where we have up to 7300. Same thing in Europe. If you get that radio, you won't really be able to use much of what we use here in the States. Uh, even 14652, the, the national simplex calling frequency, uh, you won't be able to get on. Or 446, the 70 centimeter calling frequency, you won't be able to get on. So as cool a radio as it is, I mean, if you just want it to, to sit on your mantle and, and be a, you know, a conversation starter, if you will, knock yourself out. That's a $200 conversation starter. But yeah, I, I would uh, I would advise against that um, unless you're really handy with electronics and you can figure out some way to uh, probably put in different chips that, that will open it up. Uh, I would not think that would be a good idea. So thanks for writing in, though. I appreciate it. And uh, we just saved you 200 bucks. So uh, let's split the difference. Mail me a check for 100. I'll expect it next week. This next question is something that probably quite a few of us can relate to. Uh, he's saying, I'm a fairly new ham and have recently tried doing some POTA after watching some of your videos. Nice. I had a unique experience the other day that I would think would be a good video for new hams doing POTA. I started it by calling out on 14.302. I'm sure some of you probably can already know where this is headed. To verify the frequency was not in use. Looked at the scope, didn't see any activity close. I asked if the frequency is in use a couple times with my call sign. With no response, I proceeded with my activation. I was just about 15 contacts in when I heard someone say in a hasty voice, your QRM in the Maritime Mobile Net. Huh. So I quickly replied back, sorry, and I'll move to another frequency. It's a very busy band, and I tried to find an open spot, but evidently I picked a bad spot. I guess I'll just have to ham harder. 
I think this would be a great learning experience to teach other new hams about frequency selection and proper spacing when using SSB. Also, maybe what Maritime Mobile Network is and who they support. Thanks for all your videos. They really do inspire people. Well, thank you for writing in. I'm sorry you had uh, to have that interaction with the net. Uh, unfortunately, that's all too common these days. But uh, you didn't do anything wrong. And I'm probably going to ruffle some feathers here, but you know we like to do that on the channel. Look at the shirt, for God's sakes. So this can happen really anywhere throughout the band. It's happened to me plenty of times. Uh, you'll find a frequency, you do everything right like you did, and then all of a sudden, you get QRM'd by a net. The Maritime Mobile Net is always on 14300. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but 14332, you got the YL system. When's the last time anybody heard a YL on the YL system? Somewhere down around 14, 262, 263, somewhere there's there's usually always a net. And, you know, they, they go back in, in, in time and they have their history and, you know, the, the, the guys that like to check in every day. Some would call it a service. Uh, that's a stretch. We'll get, we'll get to that in a little bit. It's a place for guys to meet up. Now, the FCC specifically says that no one, no group, no net, no nothing owns a frequency in the amateur radio bands. No one, okay? So if you find a clear frequency, nobody's on it, you have every right to use that frequency. Some of these nets would like to think otherwise, which I think is really poor operating. Uh, you know, if you want to have a net, that's fine. That's great. Say you want to have that on 14265 every day. That's great. But let's give a little bit of leeway, okay? Say plus or minus 10 kilohertz, right? How hard is it to turn your dial and find a net? We do it all the time when we're hunting soda or, or chasing soda or, or looking for DX or just finding someone calling CQ. It's not hard to find a frequency, guys, especially if someone's calling check-ins, check-ins for the Maritime Mobile Net, okay? They should have just as much courtesy to move and to listen as we do when we're getting on the air, okay? There's no reason that a net should hold any specific frequency, in my opinion. And again, I said I was gonna ruffle some feathers. I'm sure there's some keyboard commandos already typing fastidiously away, but I don't care. So let's talk about this Maritime Mobile Net. And again, a simple Google search of the Maritime Mobile Service Net will bring you to this mmsn.org page. And here I just clicked on the About Us. Now, here we have a little bit of history of who they are. The Maritime Mobile Service Network was launched on January 3rd, 1968 by Who Cares About All These People. Back in these days, U.S. Navy vessels were not allowed to have a Mars station on board. To get around this, uh, this group of short-sighted hams dedicated themselves to running phone patches for the naval vessels in the ham bands, primarily 20 meters. Here it goes on to talk about the original operating frequencies they've moved, but here, the original purpose of the MMSN was to serve those who serve in the United States military during the Vietnam crisis. Since that time, the network has grown considerably in hours of operation and services provided and consists of, this, this one gets me, of dedicated group of radio amateurs who unselfishly volunteer their time, equipment, and efforts to serve and assist those in need of communications from foreign countries and the high seas. This next part is a doozy. Our primary purpose now is that of handling legal third-party traffic from maritime mobiles, both pleasure and commercial and overseas deployed military personnel. Okay? Let that sink in. We're going to get back to that in a second. The network also acts as a weather beacon for ships during periods of severe weather, blah, blah, blah. And down here it goes to say at the International Amateur Radio Union Region 1 meeting in 2005, they decided that certain frequencies on certain amateur bands would be designated as Global Emergency Center of Activity Frequencies. The purpose of, establish, uh, of establishing these frequencies was to designate a place for passing emergency traffic on amateur frequencies should the need arise. Okay. Over the next few years, Region 2 and 3 followed, uh, and those frequencies, here we see 14300. So they talk about maritime, the ocean, ships at sea, okay? That's what it's for, in emergencies. Now, uh, 
I have seen many times when, uh, you know, say there's a hurricane in Florida or anywhere on the East Coast or whatever, uh, they will activate the actual maritime service net and they will they will hold a net for emergency track. They're legitimately doing what that just said. But what really gets me is this part right here that says our primary purpose now is that of handling third legal third party traffic from maritime mobiles, both pleasure and commercial and overseas deployed military personnel. That's their primary purpose. Tell me, does this sound like their primary purpose? I'm using a magnetic loop right now and I had to go out and uh, take it apart earlier in the day. had so much water in the variable capacitor. had to take it out and dry everything out with a hair dryer. And I think it's working right now. 1788X MFJ uh, uh, magnetic loop. Uh, do you copy me okay? It sure didn't to me. The guy's talking about his loop antenna. Uh, the net control is in Kansas, and uh, that other station was uh, nowhere near the ocean as well. Had nothing to do with what their uh, doctrine is about. Nothing at all. They hold that net every single day from 12 p.m. Eastern to 9 p.m. Eastern. Then uh, I think in the winter time, when once daylight savings time ends, uh, and from 12 p.m. to 10 p.m. So they're taking up to 10 hours a day of that frequency that they own. So this guy's on 14302, which is in the pass band. You know, he's, he's two kilohertz away from 14300. If he was on 14303, he'd probably still be getting QRM from a lot of guys using the amplifiers. But these nets are just, they think they own the world, okay? I'm going to call him out because I've been QRM'd by him so many times. I was even QRM'd by a Bible net. When me and my friend Ryan went to Baytown, took a boat out to an island and activated, I didn't film that video, we got QRM'd by a Bible net. You'd think those guys would, you know, maybe Jesus would have taught them, you know, do on to others, but nay, nay, they just started calling. I think they were, they were, they were uh, one and a half kilocycles away. Uh, and they could care less. I mean, they, they were five nine. I know they were hearing me. I went down and said, "Hey, QRM and me," and got the whole. We get on this net every day, blah blah blah, for forty five hundred years, blah blah blah. And you get the same story. So, uh, yeah, it just happens. Um, I, I don't agree with them. I think the maritime mobile net does serve a purpose in those certain times when there's actually you know, a disaster, a hurricane, or, or something going through, but, uh, you know, just rag chewing all day long on, on uh, a frequency without having any regard for any other station, uh, you know, in, in times like this, when it's not an emergency, that guy was on 14302. Those guys on that net should listen. You know, damn well, there's people that can hear that guy, but they don't care. They just, this is our frequency. We're calling and that guy's going to move. Uh, they don't even go up nicely and ask like, hey, we've got a net on 14300. Would, would you mind going up a kilohertz or two? That's all you got to do. Or better yet, the guys on the net control looking at you guys. Listen, is the frequency in use? If you hear a guy too, what what harm would it be to go down 14299? You think people aren't going to find you like seriously? So, yes, there's my take on nets. Not a fan. Can they serve a purpose? Yes. Do they do it often? No. Lastly, let's finish this on a high note. We've got a question about antennas. This viewer says, how's it going? Love your videos. Santa is bringing me a 7300 for Christmas. Well, hopefully you've been a good boy. So now I'm at the stage of picking an antenna. This is my first HF. I know you highly recommend the pack antenna. I currently live in an HOA, but will mostly be working POTA or going to open areas to operate. I was wondering what you would recommend. I'm debating between the Wolf River coils or in Fed Wave and putting it on the TN07 mast. Well, that's always the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> the fact of the matter is there is no one antenna that's gonna do everything. So my official answer, if you can, get both. And here's why. Uh, let's start with the Wolf River coils. The Wolf River coils Silver Bullet 1000 was the very first antenna I ever bought for a reason. One is inexpensive. It's what, 150 bucks maybe? Uh, so right up every ham's uh, <laughs> whatever, uh, right off the bat. 
but it does 80 through 10. You can you can actually get it to do six meters, just shorten the whip, take off the coil and all that stuff. So, like it does everything. But there is a compromise. It is a loaded antenna. You know, your your radiating element isn't that much, even even if you put, you know, the the 17 foot whip on it. So there's going to be a little bit of a compromise. It's not going to hear quite as well. You're not going to get out quite as well. Do they work amazingly? Yes. Yes, they do. I've made so many awesome contacts with my Wolf River Coils antennas. Very good for your HOA. Uh, much easier to put up than uh, an NFED half wave can be given your lot and things like that. Maybe you have trees. Maybe you don't. Maybe you have room. Maybe you don't. Who knows? Wolf River Coils literally, literally sits on the ground and you put out the three 33-foot radials and you're on the air. Or even better, you use the KB9 VBR Magic Carpet, which actually works pretty darn well, uh, which he's actually switched to like a Faraday cloth. So very quick to set up uh, and very effective. The, the downside is anytime you want to change bands, you got to go outside, you got to raise and lower the collar, uh, and especially if, you're, if your radio is inside the house, if you actually want to set up the antenna, uh, you're going you're gonna to want to bring like another piece of coax outside because probably the one that's ran inside the house isn't so easy to get outside the house uh, and hook an analyzer to it and retune it. So not the greatest thing. They are great for portable, especially when you're in areas where um, space is limited, where you might not be able to put up 33 feet for a, a 14 meter end fed or 66 feet for a 40 meter end fed. Uh, you've got that versatility with that vertical, especially with the uh, the magic carpet, the screen uh, instead of the the uh, ground rails. Now, the Pac-10 or or just let's just say any end fed half wave uh, is is going to be it, it's going to be a better antenna. It really is. If you only have a 40 meter end fed, keep in mind you're only going to be resident on four bands. You'll have 40, 20, 15, and 10. Uh, you can use a tuner if you have a good tuner and, and tune the other bands, or you can do what I do and make links for the different bands uh, that you want to get on, which is very nice. Unless you have an 80 meter end fed half wave, which is 132 ish feet long, not the easiest or practical thing to put up when you're portable. Uh, but the benefit of the NFED half wave is now you have a half wave of radiating element out in the ether, okay, radiating all the wigglies. It's just at a park uh, a few weeks ago, and I had three different antennas set up. One was the Wolf of Recoils, one was the DX Commander, and one was the Pac-10. And I had my antenna switch, which is actually right there behind the box, uh, so I could uh, ABC them, right? When I was on the NFED, I could hear stations really well. Switch to the Wolf River Coils, uh, not so much. Usually, I'm going to hear someone better on the NFED Half Wave or the DX Commander because the DX Commander is a quarter wave and, and resonant. Um, you have to understand that a Wolf River Coils is a highly compromised antenna, but they absolutely have their use. So my official answer when I get this question is if you can get them both. You really just need to decide what's going to be more practical for you if if you can only get one, and I, I would venture a guess that once you get one, you're probably gonna wanna get another. Uh, but you've really gotta, you've gotta ask yourself what features and benefits of this antenna, if you can only get one, which one has more features that fit your particular expectations? That's what you gotta ask yourself. So thanks for writing in, I appreciate it. And thank you guys for watching. If you have a question for me, shoot me an email, k at mrd at icloud.com, and you just may have one of your questions featured on an episode of Mailbag Monday. That's all I got for now. Thanks for watching, 73. We'll see you next time on Ham Radio Tube.